Uh, my name is Nathan White. I work for an organization called Access Now, and we provide digital security to users at risk around the world. We have a 24-hour uh, global helpline with offices in Costa Rica, Tunisia, and, and the Philippines. We follow the sun, helping journalists, democracy activists, gay rights activists, human rights activists around the world make sure that they have digital security so that they can do the work that they need to do to protect human rights. Uh, we're, I'm on this panel. Uh, I think what we're going to do is introduce each ourselves and then we're going to go through some basic tips for keeping yourself secure and then we're going to open it up to questions. Sounds good to everybody. I'll hand it off. Yeah, uh, I'm Jenny Gebhardt. I work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco. Uh, I'm a researcher there focusing primarily on consumer privacy and security. Um, and as part of my introduction, I wanted to tell you kind of how I think about personal security, kind of like the theory behind everything I'll say today, um, and that is door lock security. Um, often people come to trainings or they have questions about digital security and they kind of seem to have what we call security nihilism. They're saying like, it doesn't matter what I do, because no matter what I do, the NSA can own me. Um, and however true that may or may not be, um, I ask people to think about their homes, their apartments, their houses, and the security they have, you know, the structures that house all their worldly belongings as well as them. Um, and we tend to be pretty okay with the door locks that we have on our homes. Like we have a deadbolt, maybe we have like the knob lock, maybe you also have like a security system for an added layer, but all of those we know are fallible, you know, like Mm -hmm. Keys can, can be stolen, locks can be picked, um, a well-placed foot could knock down most of our doors, but we sleep at night and we're okay with that. Um, so I encourage people often to think about their digital security in the same way in terms of reasonable things that are not overly expensive that you can have a reasonable amount of confidence in. Um, so if people have questions or as we go through kind of various tips, that's how I tend to approach them. Uh, I'm Mac Blaze. Uh, I'm a professor in the computer science department uh, at uh, UPenn and I do security and cryptography and things like that. Um, you probably shouldn't follow any of my advice about what you should do because I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm, a, I'm an academic. But what I can kind of tell you is how things can go wrong rather than um, you know, what will go right. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm kind of on the, uh, on the pessimist side of this, uh, of this panel. I'm, one of, I'm not an nihilist, but I am a realist. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> So I thought we would open this up with me suggest, I, I wrote uh, 30 steps to personal security uh, about a year ago and then never did anything. So I thought this would be a good time to brush it off and pose these ideas that I've written down and then ask you if you agree with them, if you think I missed something, and if you think it's right, then explain what, what it is and how people can do it. So the first thing, uh, that we recommend or that I recommend is a, uh, a personal security assessment. What's that? <laughs> a personal security assessment oh, is exactly what you were talking about, is what is your threat model? Who are you worried about? Are you worried about surveillance from the police? Are you worried about surveillance from your parents? I don't see many teenagers in the room. Are you worried about corporate surveillance selling information? Or are you worried about just general security so you don't lose your information to hackers? Uh, I, I think that's what you were talking about. So if you were gonna do a threat model, what would you consider? Mm, yes, um, I love that you said personal security assessment because that is kind of understandable and intuitive. The term threat model is a synonym, but I find it's often kind of like intimidating. People are like, what's with this military terminology? I just have a cell phone. So I think personal security assessment is a great way to go at it. Um, and I usually think about five things. Um, one, what am I trying to protect? You know, is it access to my accounts? Is it maybe financial information? Um, what is the you know, physical or digital object that I want to keep private or limited in some way? Two, who am I trying to protect it from, which you went through. Um, one thing I'd add to the list is physical threats. You mentioned parents, also you know, spouses, roommates, teachers, uh, employers, people with any kind of like physical access to the devices or systems that you're trying to protect. Um, third, we've got what, we've got who. Then asking how, you know, if this person or entity were to come after my stuff, how would they do it? Um, you know, would it be picking a lock? Would it be rooting my device remotely? Like what, what are their methods? Um, fourth, I have who, I have what, I have how. Now it's kind of the risk assessment part. If this were to happen, if they were to succeed, how bad would it be? And how likely is it that that's even gonna happen? Mm -hmm. So we can often think of like some really, I mean, not far-fetched, but very extreme cases in which, you know, a government, 
uh, hostile to me, might totally own me. The consequences for that for a lot of people would be disastrous. For some people, that is not likely at all. For some, you know, targeted individuals, that is a real constant threat. So I often, this, this fourth step um, to me is often the one that can dispel some paranoia. We can think about things with, with disastrous consequences. We can think about them all day, but often, not always, but sometimes the likelihood is quite small. And then with these things assessed, who, what, how, and you know, how likely, what's the, um, pro probability I'm dealing with, then we come to the question that people often start with, which is, okay, so what do I do? What kind of resources, what kind of time, maybe what kind of money am I willing to invest in securing or locking down this, this thing that I'm thinking about? So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, so I think, you know, you started with the hardest part in a lot of ways, right? Because, <laughs> you know, how do you know if you're right? Um, yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, the, the, the problem is the, uh, after your, you know, after something has gone wrong, then you can kind of go back and say, oh, I didn't consider that, right? I didn't realize that they, you know, that that was going to be the, the threat. So I think, you know, it's really important in kind of this personal security assessment, or if you want to sound technical and opsec -y, you can call it uh, uh, threat modeling. But whatever you, you, you choose to call it, you kind of re have to recognize this is one of the hardest and most yeah. critical parts of the whole uh, of, of the whole thing. And in particular, here are two things that are hard about it. First is that part of it is figuring out who and what you trust. Like, what are your underlying assumptions? You know, uh, you know, if your underlying assumptions are that my phone hardware is um, not has not been tampered with, yeah. you know, physically, maybe that's true, um, but you know, maybe it isn't. Um, if your underlying assumption is that, uh, you know, this person in my life is trustworthy, you know, what if they aren't? Um, and so, you know, you, you design for something and sometimes those assumptions end up being very fragile. Uh, the second is that capabilities of, of whoever your adversary is, an adversary is another, you know, very technical uh, sounding uh, term, but, you know, whoever the bad guy is in your scenario probably is going to have capabilities that will grow over time. And you know whatever you're assuming today is likely to be an underestimate, you know, in general of what they can do a year from now. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like there's some agreement there that think about what you have and the links that you need to go to protect it. That maybe a, maybe the NSA can get to you, but if they're only going to get my you know my phone that has some phone numbers on it, I probably don't need to worry too much about it. Uh, Matt, I think this one y you'll like. Uh, First one is use encryption, both secure your devices and using encrypted uh, communications when you can. Well, yeah, why not? But uh, on the other hand... Um, I have some reasons why not, yeah. which um, I'll tell you about. Well, but uh, maybe some of my reasons for being less excited about this than you uh, <laughs> anticipate uh, are, uh, you know, are, are the same as your reasons. I mean, the first is it's really easy to regard encryption as being some sort of special magic pixie dust and, oh, I'm using encryption, and therefore I don't have to worry about it. But in fact, you know, if you're using encryption, the keys are stored somewhere, or the encryption is based on passwords, or, um, you know, it, but somewhere you have the capability of unlocking whatever it is you've encrypted, and now you have to protect that. So, you know, you're, you're protecting a lot of data with a small amount of data, but that still doesn't reduce the, sm you know, the hard problem of protecting that small amount of data. So, you know, uh, you have to recognize what the limitations of encryption are. Encryption is great for protecting data. It's terrible at protecting metadata, mm -hmm. and um, you know, the information about who we're communicating with and and when and where we were. Encryption technology kind of doesn't protect that. And then uh, we've got the problem that. In, you know, if, you're a, um, if your adversary is, for example, a government uh, and you're operating in an environment in which you're trying to stay below the radar, um, under some circumstances, and maybe this threat is kind of overstated, but under some circumstances, the fact that you've got encrypted data may be a red flag that, uh, that uh, adds more attention to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, and I can add, that's a perfect seg, um, that sometimes the presence of encryption on your phone, which is generally great, 
digital security, you know, 99.9% of cases, please use encryption when it's an option. Um, but sometimes it can be a flag or it can compromise other kinds of security, right? Digital security is not the only kind in our lives and it overlaps with physical security, community security, all these other ways we can think about security and safety. Um, so two, two notes on why, not that encryption is bad, but that encryption isn't the only thing. Um, one, encryption will not protect you from phishing. You can get an encrypted email with a malicious link in it. If you click on it, the encryption is not gonna protect you from that. Um, and often what, what, I guess often the thing that I imagine, not knowing each and every one of you personally, the thing that I imagine most people in this room would be worried about is gonna take two forms, the, kind of the most likely threat for the average computer user. It's gonna be information that's publicly available about you online, you know, on page 50 of your Google results, and it's gonna be links that are pretending to be something they're not. Um, those are not very technically exciting <coughs> or high speed, but they're by far the most dangerous, right? Because they're cheap. It's cheap for me to dig into someone's Google to try to find information about them, and it's even cheaper for me to use that information to craft an email that I think they will click on. So that's the first thing, that there are, there's this whole array of threats that are nowhere near as exciting, but often much more potent. Um, the second thing, kind of thinking about how encryption can compromise other kinds of security, yes, one absolutely, um, in many countries and settings in this world, the use of encryption or encrypted software is a red flag that you're up to something. Um, and second, sometimes, there are tools that people need to use that have no encrypted analog that protect security in other ways. Um, and one example from uh, a colleague uh, who does research in the Middle East, uh, he was working with activists and protesters and they were very immediately worried about their government coming to get them physically, you know, coming to their homes, the places where they lived and rounding them up at night. Mm -hmm. So they used an app called Zello. Uh, it's a walkie talkie app. So you're not making calls, you're not texting, you're broadcasting your voice to everyone else in your Zello group. Um, without them having to answer the phone or interact with it. So they use Zello, um, and you know everybody goes to sleep at night, one person stands watch and is looking out for the government coming to physically get people. And if, if anything go, goes wrong, they broadcast into the Zello app and they wake every, everyone up immediately. You know, a ringtone or a vibration, that's not gonna cut it. They have to wake everyone up immediately. Uh, the problem with Zello, it's not encrypted. Um, it was real easy for the government eventually um, to get onto the channel, tell the activists, you know, like, I know who you are, I know your IP address, I'm coming to get you. And indeed, some people, their physical security, their bodies were compromised because Zello was not secure. Um, so, you know, the digital security researchers come in, they say, hey, don't use insecure apps, use encryption. They said, you know, if we hadn't used Zello, they would have gotten us months ago. Um, at least this way, they got us later and they got fewer of us. Um, and we can't tell you, hey, use this great encrypted walkie-talkie app. I don't know of one. I don't know if anyone here has one, but when there's no encrypted analog, sometimes it can be really hard to, you know, as the advisors up here for digital security, to tell you to stop using this tool that you need, that your community uses, that your friends are on, just because it doesn't offer this one, like Matt said, limited feature that is encryption. Um, Okay. But so, still use it. Use encryption. So use encryption, but don't rely on it and don't think of it as a silver bullet. Uh, I also would like to add that if you do not have a serious threat, if you are not in a place where using encryption is a red flag, then you should use encryption as a good civic uh, responsibility because you're helping provide anonymity for those people who uh, do have greater, greater security risk profiles. Also, you can cut down on mass government surveillance by making it harder for governments to target uh, everybody if they have to actually spend the resources to target individuals to break the crypto. And finally, encryption on smartphones helps reduce physical theft of smartphones. So lots of good reasons to use encryption, but it's not a, a magic bullet. Um, I originally wrote this list for consumer reports, so it's very easy, and I'm gonna combine several of the next ones because it won't make sense as individuals. Uh, but they are, um, change your passwords often, use a password manager, use strong passwords, never share passwords, never use the same passwords, don't use dictionary pass, uh, words as passwords, so I'll just throw that under the umbrella of passwords. What should we know about passwords for using good security? Okay, so first of all, I mean, there's all sorts of terrible advice about <laughs> passwords out there. Um, so, you know, an example is, you know, how many people have ever, you know, been forced to enter a password and you know your, your password has to have at least one uppercase letter, at least one lowercase letter, at least one Greek letter, at least one uh, special character, you know, at least one number, and no, you know, consecutive uh, digits or whatever. Um, you know, the the truth of the matter is, 
long unpredictable passwords are better and that's what makes passwords strong right um, and a lot of these um, password um, rules are um, you know really not um, you know they're, they're sort of mythology and in fact the person who wrote the password rules for the National Institute of Standards and Technology which set standards for the US government just recently publicly stated, presumably after retiring, I had no idea what I was talking about when I came up with those <laughs> rules. Um, you know, uh, just use a long password, that's the important thing. So, um, you know, the, the, this doesn't have to be hard. Of the things that you said, the single most important one, use a password manager. Something that makes it easy to have strong passwords that are unique to every place you go. Reusing passwords on multiple websites and so on is is really a recipe for disaster. So you know if if you have to like remember one thing today, uh, use a password manager. And if you're not using a password manager, feel bad about it. <laughs> okay, well, I, I wouldn't say you should feel bad about it. You should uh, feel bad about it. No, <laughs> no. Okay. You should feel like you have the opportunity to do yeah. better. Okay, yeah. feminist offset coming in. Um, often password managers, you know, if you are an LGBT youth worried about parents, if you are a person, perhaps a woman, likely worried about an abusive partner, if there's any kind of physical risk, a password manager can be really bad. Because um, mm -hmm. you are in a position where you could be physically forced to open the password manager with your master password, mm -hmm. and then it's a log of all the accounts you have, which is kind of a reliable indicator of what you do online. And if you have an interest in hiding that from someone with physical access to your device or to you, then you shouldn't feel bad. You should feel like you've assessed your threat model and made a good choice. Sure. I will add. Regardless of whether you use a password manager or not, I think it's a great idea. I use one. Um, if you're asking like, hey, cool, make strong passwords, but how will I come up with all these passwords? Um, one fun, exciting way that involves dice, which is great for this crowd. Um, diceware is what we call it. Um, you can Google diceware, you can Google EFF diceware, and we have a nice guide. Um, we also sell dice if you need some specifically for making your passwords. Um, but it's basically a process of rolling dice to create a random-ish number, uh, correlating that number with a word, usually a weird word, on like this really long list of random words. You know, you do that four times and then you get a weird password that has nothing to do with you, right? So if you try to come up with your own password, maybe someone who knows you, maybe someone who's kind of stalking you on social media, they could figure out like, oh, you know, you like this sports team, you were born in this year, you like this song lyric, but this becomes something that is really hard for humans to guess, really hard for computers to guess, but easy for you to remember because it's random and weird. You can make a story about it. Um, I think the famous example from XKCD is correct horse battery staple. Yes, I see you. yes yeah. you know. Yeah. And then, and mm -hmm. it's so it's so memorable because it's like a horse is like battery staple. You're like, correct. So something like that, it can be yeah. fun. And it really is, I think, the most yeah. the most useful tool we have out there for creating strong passwords mm -hmm. that are easy for you to remember. Yeah, and don't use that particular password. Yeah, don't, don't do that. <laughs> Definitely don't do that. And that's a great rem reminder for why we start with figure out your threat model, that there is no one size fits all answer. What might be good for most people may not even be good for you. Uh, so this one, I will change the conceit a little bit and ask it as a question. What is two-factor authentication and why should I care? No. I can jump in. Uh, two-factor authentication goes by many names. Uh, it's sometimes called login approvals. It's sometimes called two-step verification because we need more acronyms in our lives. Um, two-factor authentication, um, you have all encountered it, I guarantee. So you know, you go to the ATM. Not only do you have to put in your card, you also have to put in a PIN. Um, two-factor authentication means using multiple steps, multiple factors to authenticate you or to log in. Um, that could also be, you know, if you are somewhere perhaps, like if you work at a bank or something, not only do you have to put in a password, you have to use your thumbprint. Um, and the factors that we talk about are generally something you know, usually like a password or a PIN, something you have. Um, it could be your phone, it could be the card that you're putting into the ATM. It could also be something you are. Biometrics, it could be your thumb pin, it could be a retina scan. Um, where we usually talk about it is logging into online accounts. So usually you put in your password, that's one factor. It is something that you know, and I'm sure it's going to be very strong and not correct towards battery staple. Mm -hmm. um, but if someone were to get your password um, through phishing, through shoulder surfing, through guessing really well, then you're sunk. They have your password, they're in. So if you use a second factor, um, then someone could have your password and still not be able to get into your account. Um, this, that second factor with um, most popular uh, platforms and profiles out there take, tends to take the form of something that goes to your cell phone. Um, it could be a text with a code, 
um, that you then put in as your second factor. Uh, it could be a code generator on your phone um, that makes random codes that you can then put in. Um, sometimes it takes the form of a YubiKey, a little kind of USB device that you stick in against something you have. There's so many ways for two-factor authentication to play out, but the, p the point is, the reason you should care is that it generates a situation for you in which if someone has your password, they still can't get in. What she said. <laughs> I, I will add, I have a pet peeve on this one. Uh, SMS-based multi-step uh, multi authentication is not great. SMS is pretty weak. Anybody can get a hold of that. If you're within the same area, you can uh, hijack it out of the air. You can call up your cell phone company and claim that I am you and reset you. Uh, SMS is not very secure. An authenticator, which is an app on your phone, which generates a unique code, which requires that you actually have physical control of your phone, is much better than SMS. However, for general people, an SMS is very convenient, and if that fits within your threat model, it's it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, next on my list, so one one point on that is that you know, in a lot of ways, you're at you're at the mercy of whatever service you're using about Optic, whether this yeah. is offered, mm -hmm. and you know. Some some offer it, but not everyone does. So it's uh, you know, sometimes you don't have a choice. I, I have a personal vendetta right now against Twitter. They they do not have any other option for multi-factor right. except SMS, and right. they also allow full account reset with SMS. Yeah, okay. So if you're asking like, but how do I know which platform offers this or not? Um, Twofactorauth.org is the bible for this. Um, I consult it regularly because um, sometimes this stuff changes changes, um, but they'll tell you if a platform offers it for like most popular platforms out there. Um, and I think it'll tell you in what forms it offers it. So it'll say like, oh, can you get text? Can you use an authenticator app? Can you use a YubiKey or a hardware token? Um, so that is really useful if you want to get started on this and start to add two-factor authentication to some of your accounts. Okay. Next one, I'll ask this one to you, Matt. What is a VPN and why should I care? Right. So a uh, VPN is, uh, stands for Virtual Private Network. Um, and basically, this is a technology for doing something that we call tunneling um, over a uh, network connection so that you can um, send all your internet traffic to a, uh, a server um, somewhere that you um, create something called a secure tunnel to, where all of your internet traffic goes to this other place on the internet through an encrypted channel and then comes out onto the internet there. Now, why would you want this? Well, the, um, you might be using a particularly insecure um, uh, connection to the network. So how many people you know, are using the hotel Wi-Fi? Well, you know, don't tell me. Um, but, uh, <laughs> don't you know, tell him. Uh, but, you know, everybody can uh, watch every, anything you're doing on the hotel Wi-Fi network at, a, at any hotel. They're notoriously insecure. What if that's your only access to the Internet that's available? You might want to use a VPN in order to get access to it. So, um, so that's one of the, the, the main applications of VPNs, is to have your, your Internet traffic go through a secure place, uh, a secure channel through this insecure network, and come out at a place that you trust a little bit more uh, to, to make it harder to see what you're doing. There are some caveats to this, though. Um, the first is that eventually your traffic is still going out onto the internet um, and you know can be intercepted somewhere. And in fact, VPN services, particularly commercial VPN services, are kind of one-stop shopping for people who want to be able to intercept uh, traffic if you can get a hold of you know the links coming out of their servers. So it's not a substitute for what we call end-to-end -end encryption between you know, your device and the website or whatever that you're communicating with. It's just something to um, uh, add a layer of security to compensate for the ease of interception of certain local networks. There's another side benefit to a VPN, which is that it can help disguise where you are located on the internet uh, from the sites that you're visiting. And the kind of extreme version of using this technology is something called Tor, which I'm sure you're going to ask about <laughs> later. Um, but uh, that building uh, up income will make it will make it, to make it more difficult, for example, for the uh, for Netflix to know, oh, I'm actually on vacation in Norway where I'm not allowed to watch this movie, but I'm using a VPN service uh, that tunnels my traffic through the United States so it lets me log into my Netflix account. 
Unfortunately, VPN uh, Netflix does block a lot of VPNs now, though. Well, but that shame on them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Jenny, should I update my apps immediately, and why? Yes. Take out your phone right now and update it. It's not rude. Just do it. Also, laptops if you have them. Um, yes, you should always update when you when it's like, hey, restart now to update. You have time. You have time to restart for your security. Um, why? Why should you always update? And this is actually one of the few tips I give out that I generally don't give caveats for. Mm -hmm. Like, you should just update. Um, because, just like we're talking about kind of door lock security, you know, nothing's perfectly secure. Some things are just more secure than others. Um, all code is sketchy. Some is just less sketchy than others. And running on your devices, running the device's OS, all the apps you have on them, there's a lot of code, and it has problems in it. Um, it is written by humans, and the humans made mistakes at some point, or things became out of date. Um, and you have, ideally, you know, teams of engineers working behind these OSs, behind these apps, to constantly find the mistakes and patch them over and fix them. And all they need you to do is click update and maybe restart. And if you don't do that, that means that there is something out there. There's a way to exploit your device or your software in some way that the world kind of knows about. And until you clicked update, you are easier and cheaper to hack. So by clicking update, you make it that much harder to hack you. Um, it is, I think, yeah, that's some of the most kind of, you know, brush your teeth, floss every day, yep. update your software and your devices. Yeah. So let me yeah. just add to that a little bit. That yeah. You will hear from people why she's wrong. And they're, let me tell you why they're wrong. Here's they're what wrong. they'll tell yeah. you. Here's what they'll tell you. You shouldn't update because you never know if the update might break something. And you know, it's conceivably possible that the update might break something, but your software, if it needs an update, is already broken. So you're, go you know, by clicking update, you're going from something that is definitely broken right now to something that has a low probability of uh, being broken after you get the update. You know, the game, you win by updating, <laughs> right? Um, you know, there is simply, you know, no sensible alternative uh, to updating. The other... Um, the other uh, exception to the rule that people try to convince you of is that, oh, they're going to add new terrible features that I won't like. And, you know, vendors okay. are sometimes bad about rolling security updates into new feature updates, and that's, you know, that's, that's, un you know, and that's unfortunate. But, uh, you know, again, on balance, just update. You know, just do it. Yeah. I'll, add, I'll add one more note um, to kind of expand on, I was saying it's more expensive to hack you. Um, how many people in this room have heard the term zero day? Okay, now be honest, how many people like know what it means? Okay, yeah, that, that's fine. It's a, it's a weird term that's not very intuitive. Um, what it means, like why we call it a zero day? It means that you know the developers, the people making the software, have had zero days to fix it. They don't know about it. Um, and then after that, there's such a thing as you know a one day vulnerability, a one week vulnerability. They've had time to work on it. And by the time you get that update, it is a vulnerability that has had many days for them to work on it, um, which means that they know about it, the world knows about it. Um, you know, one-week vulnerability doesn't cost that much on the black market. Like, you could buy one, I could buy one. And it wouldn't be very good, because updates have gone out. A zero day can cost millions of dollars, right. because they are very potent. Um, right. So when, when it's gone past a zero day, you become easier to hack, unless you click update. That but, is all. And in fact, once they've issued a patch, then one of the things that attackers do is they reverse engineer these patches <laughs> exactly. to figure out what the vulnerability is. So as soon as the yeah, patch yeah. is issued, you are now in a race with the people uh, who are trying to reverse engineer it and find ways to exploit the unpatched people. So just click update. Yeah. Thanks for adding that part, but I'm going to throw a curveball at you. No. Should folks update their apps on the hotel Wi-Fi? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's rough. Probably yeah. yes. I mean, still yes, actually. Yeah, yeah, still, still yes. yes. Look, the hotel Wi-Fi uh, is 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 a terrible environment. It is a bad <laughs> neighborhood. Um, but that said, um, most vendors of platforms have a secure channel back to the update server, and so uh, the fact that the local Wi-Fi network is um, insecure, if you're careful. Um, still will let you update. Now, where you have to be careful is if it t asks you to pr do some sort of security exception, like, oh, you have to install this new certificate now before you can go further, that's kind of the red flag to click no up to th as the answer to that question and get off that network. 
Yeah. And a trusted VPN can help you out there too. You can, yes. Uh, curveball question for you, Jenny. Why for most people in the room is an attachment in an email going to be the biggest threat? Yeah, oh man. Not only is the attachment in the email your biggest threat, you are your biggest threat because you're the one that has to click it. Um, yeah, really most kind of contemporary hacking involves your unwitting participation. Um, I think like I alluded to earlier, there are a lot of really, really expensive ways to hack us. Um, you know, governments, technically skilled people, intelligence agencies, people with a grudge against us that they could use. Um, but why bother with getting around technical safeguards <coughs> when I could just send you a link that I think you want to click on, I could send you an attachment that looks alluring, and then you do the work for me. You download it, you click it, um, you know, you put in login credentials on a page that's pretending to be a login page, and then you do all that work for me. So an attachment in email, a shortened link in an email, you know, like bit.ly, don't click on that. Um, lengthen it first. Um, there are, I mean, yeah, the, the litany of kind of famous human rights defenders um, and high profile targets who have been hacked with bit.ly links mm -hmm. uh, is terrifying. Um, and again, I mean, phishing. Uh, do phishing attacks have anything in common that we should look out for? They do, so many things. Um, the list generally begins with urgency. Uh, the phishing attack will either promise you something that's too good to be true, you have to act now, or it will scare you with something that you don't want to happen, and you have to act now. Um, so that can take the form of, most often it's like, hey, your account has been compromised. Um, and if you just click here and you put in your login information, if you put in your credit card information, then we'll take care of it for you. Um, to be honest, I fell for one of those. I fell for a B of A one. And I put in my B of A information. Five minutes later, I was like, oh god, what have I done? And I canceled the card. Um, but it's, it's easy to fall for. This stuff is really, really good. So first, urgency. Something, or you know, something good is happening. You know, free giveaway. Um, Activists at EFF have got ones is like, hey, we want you to come to this conference. It's like, that's this kind of stuff that we click on. Um, so first thing, urgency, too good to be true, very bad and you want to avoid it. Um, second thing, link shorteners. Um, links that just don't look quite right. Um, and along with that, maybe email addresses from the sender that just don't look quite right. Um, maybe there's a one kind of stuck in there randomly. There's a period between you know two parts of a name. Um, the kind of thing where if you glance at it, you're like, oh, I, I know this person. But if you scrutinize it, maybe not. Um, and unfortunately, you know, things like uh, Google Plus and Gmail, they make it quite easy to pretend to be someone else's account visually. Mm -hmm. You know, if you copy someone's picture, you copy their background. If I just glance at an email from one of my friends, I was like, oh, you know, there's a picture, there's an email, this visually looks right to me, and I'll think nothing of responding. Um, I think that was one thing that got a lot of people um, in the Google Drive uh, phishing that was going around recently. A lot of us send out Google Drives um, attachments or files to each other all the time. It would not be unusual to receive a Google Drive file from any number of contacts. And if it kind of looks right, you're going to click on it. You're going to trust the visual part of it. So often I say to people, if something you're like, you know, your spidey senses are tingling, scrutinize the link, scrutinize the sender address. And if something is wrong there, then you know, mm -hmm. you know that it's not right. So that's yeah. the short list of things. Yeah, let me just add an a, a rambling anecdote to that. <laughs> um, the uh, So one of the things I work on is uh, voting machine security. So um, in 2007, I did a study for the state of Ohio and then the state of California, participated in this top to bottom review of electronic voting systems. We discovered, you know, these machines are just riddled with hor horrible security bugs. And if you touch, you know, the only thing that you can't do is injure the voter, but everything else is, uh, you know, um, the, is, is really um, uh, horrible about the security of these voting machines. Okay, fast forward to 2016. Pretty much none of these vulnerabilities have been been fixed. A lot of them are fundamentally architecturally bad. And it turns out that some country, uh, rhyming with Musha, apparently was um, trying uh, seriously to um, hack US elections. And some of the documents of the investigation which is still ongoing into that, have leaked out. Uh, for example, the reality winner uh, documents uh, um, have leaked out. And a fascinating thing about this, we know and have known for 10 years that these machines have exploitable vulnerabilities. We even know what they are. So the first question I asked is, which of the many exploitable vulnerabilities that we knew about did the uh, this uh, unnamed foreign nation state exploit in the US uh, voting infrastructure. And it turns out that the answer appears to be, as far as we can tell, none of them. What did they do? They did phishing attacks 
against and sent Trojan horses in email attachments to voting officials to get them to run compromised software to um, mess with the registration databases. Why? Because that's easier, right? Um, you know, there, yeah, there are exploitable vulnerabilities in these systems, but why bother exploiting them when I can just send email to a voting official and say, you know, that uh, says, please click on this attachment with the latest software update, and they'll happily install my malware, you know, for me. Yeah, software updates don't come in emails. Yeah. Important note. Right. Because you should still update your software. Mm -hmm. So like, if I had to pick a problem to solve to make the world better, it would be phishing and, and, and these attacks. So phishing happens online. Is there an equivalent that happens offline? Great question. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Um, vishing, you know, voice phishing, phishing, smishing with texts is a thing. Um, and I mean, I, I get vishing and smishing regularly. Um, and they're kind of just the spam calls that I think for most people in the room are set off immediate red flags. like. Hello, you have won and all expenses paid. Like you've all gotten those and you're like, ah, delete, hang up. But I mean, maybe if you're not as tech savvy as a lot of people in the room, you'd be like, oh my gosh, yes, I want a thing. I want to stay on the line. Um, you might get a weird call from a bank that you do not bank with, um, get a weird text with a shortened link in it. Um, so this stuff can show up anywhere. Yeah, not, not just an email. One of my favorite examples of social engineering is somebody went into a office building and put up a sign that said, if your computer crashes, call this number. And it was their number, and they just waited for the computer crash. So oh, the employee yeah, said, yeah. oh, there's a sign on the wall that says, I call this number, and called up the hacker. And the hacker said, hi, I'm here to help you. Let me walk you through how to install my malware on your machines. Yeah. First open terminal <laughs> and type this in. So um, even offline, if somebody calls you, the, the sense of urgency, if somebody says you must open this right away because the boss needs this financial information, call your boss and confirm it. Uh, oh, I glucked. What else, what else we got? What else do we have? Uh, how many people in this room have anything blocking the cameras on their phones or computers? That's pretty good, That's about 40%. Uh, let's go to the audience. Somebody who raised their hand, tell us why. Over here. <laughs> it is creepy. Oh. Can we turn I'll, I'll just repeat you. Even if the camera night light is not on, he says. They can still access your camera and have it running. Yes. That is why. <laughs> Do you want to add to that? Yeah, microphones are also a problem. It does help, a lot of them you can, if you plug something in that's just headphones, sometimes that will shut off the microphone, but not always, there's no, re no red flags for that. Or there's no silver bullets, I mean. Uh, so um, recently uh, we were talking about uh, OK Google and Alexa. We were talking about OK Google and Alexa, and there was a question of whether a anesthesiologist could actually have it in the operating room and the HIPAA committee, the uh, regular, regulatory committee, said that they, they could not because Alexa and HIPAA is a turned on microphone and it, that would uh, oh, violate patient, pr patient privacy. That's a great, yeah. great yeah. addition. I haven't even considered that. Yeah, so let me, let me just add one thing to that. You can't, one of the interesting things about apps on the internet is it's really hard to know based on what the app does how much information is being sent out to remotely to a third party. Like there are two ways to implement Siri and Alexa and, and you know all of these voice-based systems. One way is to do all the voice processing on the phone itself uh, and convert it from speech to text just using processing on the phone. Another way to do it is to send the audio up to a server at Google or Apple or some some third party to, to do that with their servers. And which one makes sense to do? basically varies over time. So, you know, in 2016, the answer was do a lot of it up at the, um, uh, at a central processor. Uh, now, the, they're trying to do it more locally on the phone as those, as those centralized uh, systems get more overloaded as more people use them. Next year, it's, the pendulum's probably gonna swing in the other direction. So, you can't know, actually, just by what it does, how it's working and what information is leaking. So. Um, it, you know, it's really hard to make an assessment of like how much privacy are you giving up by using this. 
Okay, next question. We'll say this for the, the panel or the audience. What is HTTPS and why is the S important? Um, the S stands for uh, secure socket or something to that effect. Yeah. Exactly. You want to yes, the S stands for secure. Um, so kind of in broad terms, there are two ways, you know, when you're on a browser, there's two ways for that website to get to you. HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTPS, which is the same thing, but secure, um, but end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, and why you should care, particularly if you're on the hotel Wi-Fi, um, is that HTTP is open to all sorts of eavesdropping, of content hijacking, um, of censorship, uh, targeted censorship. Um, it is... It's kind of like, it's, it's a postcard. HTTP is a postcard. Anyone can look at it. Um, HTTPS is end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, if it's after the slash, right? So if you're on you know, EFF.org slash digital dash security, all anyone who's trying to look can see is the EFF.org part. After the slash, the more granular information, that's gone. So an eavesdropper can't see it. Um, that content cannot be hijacked. Let's say a government, if they want to censor a specific page on EFF.org, a specific page on Wikipedia, they can't get to that page anymore. They have the choice now between wiping out the entire site, because all they can see is before a slash, or letting it happen. Russia faced this with Wikipedia. Um, they tried to shut it down. It didn't work out well for them. Wikipedia is back up in Russia. Um, but yeah, for you personally, it's it's kind of the number one defense against that kind of hijacking. Um, sites are increasingly moving to HTTPS and providing you with it. Um, sometimes a little bit of the S part will fall through the cracks. Um, sometimes only one part of a site is HTTPS if it's hosting you know, third party content from advertisements. Um, so one thing you can do um, is download from EFF where I work, um, download HTTPS everywhere. Yes, I see, I see some fans. Um, and that will catch the HTTPS that might be falling through the cracks as implementation goes forward and make sure that you have it whenever it is available to you. The Matt signal, which shows that Matt Blaze has to be on the opposite side of the con, is, is uh, showing. Starting to show, so yeah. I know you so are I'll, going to leave yeah. early. Is there I'll anything you'd like to add? Five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Do, ev do everything these people say. <laughs> <laughs> and. OK. Um, Jenny, is there anything that you want to add before we go to questions? Uh, no. <laughs> OK, then uh, let's take questions from the audience for yeah. specifics. This, this was a comment earlier about the, the covering the cameras. Be alert for the school district next to mine issued laptops to the students. They were essentially compromised when they were issued, not by malware, but the fact that the administration could see you at home. Mm -hmm. Lower Marion? Yeah. Lower, Lower Marion. Marion. Yeah. Yeah. And right. Literally, the parents refused to sue because they were the ones that were going to eat the insurance bill from their own school district. Yeah, yeah student privacy is a whole another another part of this, but that's a great point. Kind of Bef school issue devices that are yours. Before yeah. we do the next question, I want to recap because I know people are going to be taken off for the next panels. Uh, the, the top line messages I think that we've all agreed on are use strong passwords, use a password manager, update your apps, use a VPN. Is there a fifth one we want to add for make it balanced? Listen to these guys. <laughs> Uh, I, I suppose that, that does help. Uh, my organization does have a digital security helpline for users at risk that you can contact for specific questions and specific advice. And I think most people are familiar with EFF, who does this as their bread and butter. Um, yeah, and for questions, um, I'm on the next panel, so I'll be sticking around even once we're off the mics. But let's try to get in as many as we can now. Yeah. Uh, a quick question about um, securities and cell phones. I know um, through darknet sources and the like, there are some uh, emulations for cell phone towers. I was wondering if you guys think that that's going to be a, a more normal thing in larger cities um, at the moment. Uh, well, law enforcement use cell yeah. phone emulators all the time to be able to try to track your phone. I, I think as that technology becomes more common, yeah, we're going to see it. I don't personally think it's a threat that I would tell most people that they need to be worried about. Uh, you do want to be on a network you trust when you're updating your phones, but I, I don't think that that's a big enough threat that I would say that, that you would even want to think about it when you're updating. Um, maybe that'll change over time, but I think for most people that's probably not a big threat, but it's a good thing to be paying attention to. Two-factor authentication. Most of the websites I have that use it offer a text message or an email. Mm -hmm. Go into my phone. I get both of them. It doesn't matter. 
email better, safer, or should I text message? What? So I, I actually do prefer email. Uh, email will go to many different devices because I have an iPhone, an iPad, and, and a computer, and all of them have email. So it does go to mul multiple places, uh, but the SMS is so insecure that if it's something that you're really concerned about and you really want to protect, I'd rather have it go to my email because I know that at least has another level of password protection where you can get an SMS off my phone without ever needing my password. I'll also add that kind of one layer of all the security is whether or not you're going to use it. Um, so I always encourage people to think through, like, yes, the insecurity of our phone system of, S of SMS, the additional password protection in, um, in some, with something like an email account, um, the additional protection with an authenticator app. But often, you know, all other things equal, it really does come down for me to what are you going to use. Like 2FA, two-factor authentication, as awesome as, as it is, is often just really inconvenient. Sometimes I'm signing in and I tell myself, like, feel the burn. This is what security feels like. Because it's just hard and inconvenient. Um, but if you use it, it is probably often more secure than if you're not using it. So all the things equal, just also go with the thing you're going to use and you're going to use consistently. Because that is, that is the best protection in a lot of ways. Uh, when you use a VPN, everything that you send goes through that VPN. And that means uh, if any place that you log in for accounts or anything like that, uh, all of your password, all of your login information and all of your password is going to that VPN. That VPN will have then a, an entire list of everything that you do. Y yes uh, and no. And I, I, I'm just wondering, to what extent are you then trusting uh, your VPN? Have so there been any, uh, ha has that been an issue? And I if so, do you have recommendations on a trusted VPN? We were having this conversation just earlier. In the world. One clarification though, if, yeah. if you're putting in your password, uh, like you're going to your Gmail account and you're putting in your password, as long as that's HTTPS, your VPN will not see your password. They'll know you went to Gmail, but they won't see that the encrypted uh, bits that you put through it. That being said, yet yeah, you are trusting your VPN. Uh, you don't want to go with a fly-by-night VPN that you've never heard of. You have no idea if it's actually law enforcement, if it's using any encryption at all, or if you can trust them not to sell your data. Uh, and because you are trusting them and because it's difficult, it's very hard for folks like us to say specifically here is one company that you can trust. Um, I will say a few that have tr that I have some reason to trust. Uh, Private Internet Access is a VPN that's been around for a very long time. They show up at security conferences. They actually sponsor security conferences. So because they are people and they've been part of the community, I have a little more trust in them. Uh, another uh, company that's pretty common is called TunnelBear, and I like them because they just did the first third-party security audit for a VPN and released the results. So that gives me some reason to trust them. Ultimately, you are going to trust them. Personally, I like to use VPNs that are outside of the country because I have a little bit more of a strain in trusting them, but if law enforcement wanted to come and say, hey, we know you're using a VPN and we want all of that web traffic, they have to go to another country to request that, which means they have to go to the, the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty and that will take them six months. And I don't want to make it easy for them. <laughs> Yeah, th th there's a comment that there are fake VPN browser apps that are basically just honeypots of trying to suck up your data. So be careful, do a little bit of research, look for you know reasons to trust them, look for being part of the community. Um, it, don't just trust a slick marketing manifesto about how we're gonna do, we're gonna protect your privacy no matter what, because there's always going to be limitations. If they are a company, they are going to have to comply with lawful demands. Um, so do some research and remember that you, you are putting your trust in them. Um, but that's also why to look for the HTTPS. So don't put anything through that isn't HTTPS because then you're getting multiple layers of encryption. Who's, who's got the box? So earlier the question was brought up uh, whether or not we should do an update to our computer even if we're not on a secured network. Uh, and my question is, What's to say that there isn't somebody waiting for someone to do an update says, hey, that's me, and then it installs a beef hook on your browser? Yeah, so 
this is where it starts to get more complicated that if you are of a particular like if you are a heightened threat you might not want to for the most part there's you know 80,000 people here it would be really hard for somebody to set a trap for you as an individual um, also when you update through like your phone or your computer system, it has a, uh, a signed verification that goes to the manufacturer. So you're usually okay. If you were Edward Snowden and NSA knew you were here, yeah, they, they could do it. You, you, would, you would be screwed. But for most people, you're probably okay. That's gonna just be too expensive and too complicated for law enforcement or most adversaries to do on any kind of non, non-hyper-targeted basis. Um, okay, so I do everything you say. I have VPN on my phone, I have VPN on my computer, I put tape on my microphones and my cameras, um, everything else. I use a password manager, all my passwords are random numbers and letters, blah, blah, blah. So what happens when I read in the news, Target gets breached, 80 gazillion credit cards, Home Depot, Federal Government Office of Personnel mm -hmm. Management, my uh, social was leaked. They were kind enough to give me three years of uh, identity theft protection, nice even though my SSN will be out there for the rest of my life. Um, and then we have Internet of Things, just smart light bulbs, um, smart thermostats, lazy developers that are installing debug backdoors with the 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 login as um, admin admin. And, and oops, now my my network's compromised. So how do we as consumers force companies and industry to? adopt stricter standards and, I don't know, stop being lazy and making mistakes that compromise well, I our donate security. to EFF and make sure that they're fighting the good fight for us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Shameless plug. Uh, but no, <laughs> Probably that, not what, we, what there, you were asking. There are a few things that you can actually do. One, yeah. um, companies are going to get targeted and they're going to get hacked all the time. One thing I like to do is use a different email address for all of them. So if an email address and a password gets hacked in one place, it's dead. It's, you know, if it's my name plus target at my at a domain, then that is the only place that that's ever going to be used. So if target gets hacked, I don't care. Uh, I also don't like to give my email when I don't have to. I use a service called 10 Minute Mail to sign up for a lot of things. It creates just a webmail email address that will exist for 10 minutes unless you click you need another 10 minutes and you can sign up for things. Um, it, yeah, Internet of Things and machine learning are very scary and things we talk about uh, yeah. and worry about. Uh, it's going to continue happening and that's why the base level of protecting yourself in the ways that you can is so critically important. Look out for phishing. That's always going to be the cheapest and easiest and most effective way for people to get information about you. If they get a large information, if they get the target database, what they're probably going to do is they're going to look for your email and look for your uh, password and then use that on Twitter, use that on LinkedIn. Where else did you use that same password and that same email address? So if you're using strong passwords in a password manager, you've already circumvented what they're going to do. Um, you don't have to be you don't have to outrun a cheetah, you just have to outrun everybody else. <laughs> I'll also add, um, part of the concern for me at least with kind of different breaches of companies with whom I've entrusted information is not necessarily, it's definitely a concern, but it's not my primary one that there will be identity theft or someone's gonna go grab my social security number, my credit card information. My bigger concern, and maybe also as a woman on the internet, is that someone's going to put that together with all sorts of other information on page 50 of my Google results and you know, maybe dox me, maybe use that information to write a really, really convincing phishing email with details from my life. So one thing you can also do is kind of do a little, you know, personal assessment, Google yourself and see what you come up with. Um, log into a different browser um, where you're not logged into your Twitter, your Facebook, your other profiles and see what is available publicly. It can surprise you, um, but I always tell people kind of don't blame yourself. Blame the companies that tricked you into defaults that made this stuff available. It's really not your fault. And then once you see it, you can kind of be like, oh, you know, I didn't know that was out there. Like, huh, I didn't know my parents' home address was on this People Finder website from when I was in high school. You can kind of start to see what's out there and then take the steps, you know, baby steps. You're chipping away at kind of this very large data industry. Um, I'm, con take I'm continually surprised. It's so much easier to find someone's home address than it is their email address. Which is weird. Yeah, or phone number. Um, so just go Google yourself, see what you find, um, and then you can take the steps to start to take that stuff down. Um, start to contact. You can legally contact the people finder sites. They have to take your stuff down if you ask. It can be a labyrinth, but P you can do it. PIPL.com is a good place to start. Yeah, always um, a good that's what, that's what I recommend. Yeah. Don't I, I don't like to recommend it to anybody because it's creepy if you use it on other people, but it's a good place to start to see what is available about yourself. Um, and some of them, the people finders will charge you like six or seven dollars to get your own report. 
if an adversary is targeting you, they, they will pay yeah. six or seven dollars, so it's worth it if you're concerned to see what is available at you. And you will see your your parents' information, your aunts, your cousins, and then you know those are the kinds of things. If I get an email from somebody saying urgently your cousin in this city is in danger, you know, well, I know that that information is available on the web, so I'm gonna call my cousin and confirm before you know jumping into it. It's a, it, it's a deeper step to go in to think like your adversary, but if you do have an adversary, they're going to do it. So, yeah. Well, I guess kind of to answer your question more, to me it's about minimizing the information that's online about me that's under my control. I cannot control if Target gets hacked. I'm not an engineer there. But I can't control what else is out there to collate with information that may inevitably sometime leak. Um, so not to kind of be, again, a nihilist about it, but there is a lot that's under your control, and if you can minimize that, you're in a, you're in a really good spot. So earlier you mentioned about uh, phishing attacks with people using like a dot or adding a number in the middle of your email address to try to pretend that they're you. If you discover that someone is trying to be you and using your background photo, what can you do about it? I mean, you can report the profile. Um, sorry, I'm trying to think. I, I have an NDA that uh, Im implicates how I can answer this question. Um, <laughs> For certain services, that threat won't be a problem forever. Um, <laughs> sorry, yes. that's, that's vague. Uh, Next question. <laughs> re re report them. Uh, companies, particularly the big companies, are aware that that's a problem, and they are taking steps to try to make that, to, uh, to cut down on that. Um, so just report them, and, and companies are aware of that threat and are working on it. Yeah, I mean, re report them, and then if the profile doesn't get taken down for a long time, contact EFF, and we will try to help you. But that... It's a threat that people are aware of. Spammers are everywhere. Um, companies are like pretty good at taking down spammers. They're bad at taking down other people who shouldn't be taken down, but report them, yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I was wondering if you have an opinion on the usefulness of third-party uh, software encryptors, you know, like, well, TrueCrypt, but now like VeraCrypt or mm. st stuff like that. You know, how useful are they? How, how um, mm. good are they at fending off attacks, that type of thing? Man, so that, th yeah. that, that's a tough question. It, it's a tough question because some of them are actually pretty good, and because they are pretty good, people post things that law enforcement care very, very strongly about and therefore target them with some of the highest level tools. Um, so it, I think you just have to recognize that you are trusting a service, and I can't tell you whether or not you should trust a service, and if I did, it might change tomorrow. Um, that, I think that's pretty much all I, all I can say. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately it is. It's a constantly changing landscape that's really hard to assess, kind of systematically. Um, there is yeah, no, I wish I had a better answer. Up, there is no security system that's going to be perfect forever. forever. Yeah. So even if we said yes today, it may not be tomorrow. So I would, I would say make your own judgment on whether you trust it, but continually update that assessment yeah. of whether you trust it. And it is kind of another thing to keep in mind when we talk about trusted sources. I mean, I'm on the record as referring to Gmail, for example. Their security team is the best damn security team on earth. Um, however, you know, I trust Gmail now. Do I trust who's going to own them in 10 years? In 20 years? In 50 years? Um, I mean, this is a, kind of a very, something really at the forefront of a lot of Americans' minds. You know, I, I was kind of okay with the NSA gun when it was in the hands of another dude, but now we loaded it and put it in someone else's hands, oh. maybe. Um, so I think always think about, you know, Sometimes we can be very sure about who we trust now, but we can't really predict what's going to happen in the future. So that's just another, not even a tip, but a kind of a, a way to approach this stuff and a way to approach kind of this really fraught question of trust. Do we have time for one more? Hi, um, I have a threat modeling question. Let's say you are active under a pseudonym online that you would like to keep segregated from your real identity. Let's say you have a Twitter handle and you don't want to get doxxed, or you're, you have a handle in a fandom forum and you've got no terrible flame war and you don't mm -hmm. want someone taking revenge on you. Um, what are some of the biggest things that you can do to keep those separate and what, what are some of the pitfalls that people wouldn't expect? So, yeah. well, is, is your threat law enforcement or is your threat like an X? It's, Random jerks on the yeah. internet. So <laughs> people with a grudge. Yeah. yeah. Random jerks on the internet are don't use the same information for one account with the other account. So Jenny and I are different people. I would never use Jenny's account on my Yahoo. So keep them entirely separate. 
Um, if you say like your username, which is just your username before the domain, and you use that on another platform, but it also has a domain, that can get tracked back to you. Um, if you keep them entirely separate, they're entirely separate. If your threat is law enforcement, it gets a lot harder because they can go to uh, the provider and say, give us the IP addresses for who this information was. Um, but if you're just worried about random people on the internet, as long as you treat them truly separate and do not use the same information, the same passwords, the same password resets, that, or any connected email addresses for alternate backup links, you'll probably be okay. Yeah. But, you know, take that with a grain of salt. There's never any perfect yeah. solution. Yeah, I'll add some things. Greetings, fellow women on the web. I feel your pain. Because um, this is a very real threat for a lot of us, right? This is something that ha can happen unexpectedly and can snowball in scary ways that we've heard about in the news. Like, I think about this all the time. Um, one common pitfall is phone number. Um, and we were talking earlier about two-factor authentication in Twitter, where a lot of us use kind of our pseudonymous handles that we don't want to associate with other, pl with other places. Twitter, like a lot of profiles, if you give them your number once, they have a tendency to fill it into any blank they possibly can. Um, and that is one way that two accounts could become linked when they're linked to the same phone number that you can reliably say receive text from for two-factor authentication. So phone number is a big one. Um, Pictures. Um, I think a lot of people often think about pseudonymity as handle, but maybe not as pictures. Um, reverse lookup is a thing, reverse image lookup. Um, I also tell people that for dating profiles, another place where we might like some pseudonymity or separation from you know, our work identity, our friend and family identity. Um, if you're using a picture of yourself, which you can do sometimes with a pseudonymous handle, make sure it's not a picture that is used anywhere else with you on the web. That's another place to Google yourself, not just with your name or your address or your phone number. Also, reverse image lookup on Google uh, your various profile pictures, because they could show up. I had a profile picture that I thought I only used in one place, and it was in like some announcement from when I was in college, and I used it as a headshot. Mm. Like These pictures can end up in places where you didn't put them. But if you use them at all, so that can be another pitfall. I think phone number and picture are two kind of places to start. Also, if you have a picture that's not of you, maybe it's something you drew or a thing you used to represent yourself, that can end up in other places that you maybe don't, didn't have control over, didn't think of. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. That's, Thank you. That's great. Do we, uh, do we have time for one more? Or we got the hook. Yeah, we need, we need okay. 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 All right. We'll be hanging out if you want to come up. Yeah.